Hello again, folks. Welcome to another edition of Media Watch. I'm your co-host, Eric Tate. I'm Bob Anthony. And I'm their friend, Alan Singer. <laughs> Our guest par excellence, Dr. Alan Singer. Uh, Alan, tell folks a little bit about your background for the folks who have not seen our show before. I'm a, a professor of education and history at Hofstra University, which is Hempstead, New York. I'm also a former New York City high school teacher, and I'm a lifetime resident of uh, the, the boroughs. <laughs> and indeed, you're also a prolific blogger on a number of platforms. So uh, uh, some of which I think we incorporated in some of these shows. And I think one of your latest blog will fit in nicely with this discussion we're going to have. <laughs> so so we, we, we should jump off based on what's going on in the news and based on a, a sort of an outline. And that's basically what's the Republican and Donald Trump's strategy of delaying tactics and what that portends to the outcome of the election. So let's start with that, Alan. The bottom line is we've been saying that the lawsuits and there have been like three major delaying tactics, lawsuits, and then hope for recounts at the various state levels. And the bottom line is maybe uh, as that incident in Michigan last night indicated, the back door, let's not certify. So let's jump off with that, Alan, because you're good on, on the certification of electors and what might happen. The, the attempt to steal the election. <laughs> okay. If they, if they make it a continuous attempt to steal the election, that would constitute a coup and in very frightening implications. First of all, all the charges are bogus. Uh, the cyber division of Homeland Security said this was the safest, most protected election in the United States history, at which point Trump fired the director of Homeland Security's cyber division. There's absolutely no evidence other than Rudy Giuliani's uh, crazy head uh, that anything was done here. I, you know, they, it was one thing I saw on TV that was absolutely amazing. They claimed they found proof that uh, a dead man had voted. And so um, TV sent uh, people to the house and it turned out it, apparently the dead man had not voted. It was Mrs. So-and-so his wife, who was very much alive. So this has nothing to do with reality. And I'm not sure, but I think there are two things going on. One, I think Trump may recognize that he's lost and he's done. But he does not, he wants to, if he leaves, he wants to be able to leave in charge that the election was stolen to protect his brand that he is not a loser. Uh, he also wants to uh, maintain his position that it was stolen so he can get a national audience on radio and television to recoup his financial position. And also, in case he wants to run in 2024, he would run that it was stolen from us. Uh, so I think that's a big part of what Donald Trump is involved in. And last, by arguing it was stolen, it puts him in a position that any federal or state charges against him for his illegal activities, uh, he will charge these, argue these are just political. Yeah. So that yeah. may be his strategy. Yeah, all, all three of the, of, of the above are, are probably what's in play on the chessboard, Bob. What, what's your take on Alan's assessment? Well, the, the person who was fired by uh, Trump, the head of uh, cybersecurity, Mr. Krebs, uh, I believe has been there since the division, since the position was created. So he's been here for quite a while uh, through uh, more, uh, through multiple administrations. And uh, he's hardly a political uh, appointment. Uh, he does his job is what he does. And he confirmed that this was a cleanly run election for and for that, of course, he get, he gets fired. So that's that's one big uh, uh, stain against Trump. And you mentioned the Michigan uh, shenanigans that went down yesterday, where we had the the two Democrat, uh, two Republican certification board for uh, 
Wayne, I believe, yeah, Wayne County, uh, Detroit, uh, which includes Detroit and Michigan. And the two Republicans voted no, which resulted in the split. In other words, the votes for Detroit at that point could not be counted, could not be certified. They were blistered live on the Zoom call and on the internet and <laughs> all over the place and basically flip-flopped in minutes and decided to certify those votes. Uh, but uh, without that flip-flop, uh, those votes would have been in danger that easily just because two minor Republicans in a minor role as election certifiers uh, almost caved under pressure to uh, not, not certify it. So Alan is dead on uh, in his uh, uh, assessment of danger here. Yeah, but the, the key part is they're not really minor because they are in key positions for certification of those votes. And that, as we have been saying on Media Watch, and finally the rest of the mainstream broadcast media have finally begun to understand the end game, which is if you delay the certification past the deadline, then it can be bounced back to the states so that state legislators in Republican controlled states could try their best to appoint Trump electors. And that's the coup you were talking about, Alan. Yeah. That's their- Yes, Al Alan's done a good job of educating us in the past yeah. couple of, of, of appearances. And, and, and yeah, I've, I've tried to catch up read up on this and yeah there is yeah, a yeah. it's a rough road a very potholed road but it is a possible road for, that for is, a coup that is the game plan i believe that they actually telegraphed way back when he started saying it's a fraudulent election trying to cast doubts on the actual outcome of the election so that there would be a delay in certification of these electors now they've tried the legal strategy and I remember one story that jumped out at me immediately was the fact that one of the postal workers signed an affidavit that said he had overheard his people saying, we're going to change these ballots and make them in favor of Joe Biden instead of Donald Trump. Uh, and immediately the postal inspectors jumped on him and said, okay, let's have this investigation. Let's talk about what you are saying transpired. His boss immediately said, that's a lie. We'll dig into that. And as soon as they hit him, he recanted his statement. However, the Trump people, just like they jumped on the Michigan certification board who balked, say a win for the country, et cetera, they jumped on his false affidavit stuff, which amazingly enough, they put the video online and turns out that the old James O'Keefe people who took down those folks with their trumped up video about Acorn being bad people, same people were behind this guy with his affidavit. And so the bottom line was, it was another trumped up attempt to try to use the legal system. So I believe he's either one for 25 in the lawsuit. And I, I may have seen where that one just got reversed by the Pennsylvania <laughs> Supreme Court. This is the, the Wednesday before our Monday <laughs> when we're talking about all these shenanigans going, going on. But if he doesn't do it by legal means and they're losing when Rudy Giuliani is your key lawyer to win these phony cases, you don't have much of a chance. <laughs> so now they're hoping that these electors are gonna be able to be delayed for confirming the actual vote take. So Alan, to well, go let me back, address that. You, you, you go back and, and, and give us again why you think he's trying to make sure he steals this election, even if he's not successful, what his goals are. Well, the electoral college of the United States, the United States didn't have one election on November 3rd we had 51 elections. Each was a winner take all except for Maine and Nebraska. What happens is that Joe Biden won 306 points. Donald Trump won 232. Joe Biden was elected president. Well, one of Trump's strategies is, as you said, is to invalidate the Biden vote. 
And one way they could possibly do it is the official vote tally takes place on December 14th. If you can slow the counts and slow the certification and disrupt the process, if it, they can't have their meeting on December 14th, you know, virtual, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you, they can't vote. So in 2000, the Supreme Court threw out the Democratic appeal, I believe it was uh, December 8th, so that that vote could take place on the designated day. Mm -hmm. uh, one Trump strategy that people have said is that he's trying to delay it. If they could prevent the Electoral College from making its decision, 306 to 232, then under law, the decision goes to the House of Representatives. But it's a funny decision in the House of Representatives because the Democrats have a majority. But in this case, each state delegation gets one vote, mm -hmm. which means Wyoming representing about half a million people has one vote and California representing 40 million people has one vote. So in theory, the small states, which are largely Republican, could give the election to Donald Trump, even yeah. though they represent one third of the country. That's the outside game plan that they're trying to pull the coup in front of our eyes with. Now, this has happened kind of twice in U.S. history. In 1824, a backroom deal was made. And the number two candidate was supported by the number four candidate. He was elected president. And in 1876, during Reconstruction, you know, do we see the white reps or the black reps? Mm -hmm. uh, they finally made a deal. And the deal was a very nasty one. That's they would give the presidency to the Republican candidate, but they would turn over control over the free people in the South back to the slaveholders. Yep. They basically torpedoed reconstruction with that backroom deal for the presidency. So these, if this happens, it's going to be very nasty. And that's why I said that would constitute a, a coup. Mm -hmm. I don't expect this to, to go that far. I really think Trump is manipulating for political advantage rather than to somehow pull out the election at this point. But I, I we tend to never know. I, I tend to uh, I do agree with you uh, that he has little chance, and uh, I'm I'm boosted by the fact that he has Rudy Giuliani for the top attorney. I mean, if any uh, if anybody could lose this case <laughs> quickly, it would be him, since so far what he's presented, uh, let's say in Pennsylvania uh, yesterday, in Williamsport of all places. Uh, I mean, it, from the reports I read, he was so. Uh, loose with his knowledge of the law. And, and I guess he forgot the judge's name at one point and, and had to be uh, taught on the meaning of the word opacity. So uh, luckily he's as unqualified as any particular lawyer they could have at this moment. But I think you're right in saying that Trump wants to solidify his base so that he could continue working with it for the next four years. And just like you said, uh, make sure he has the money that he needs for, for the next four years uh, for his campaign and his legal defenses. Uh, and basically to remain a force because his ego re re requires him to have followers. So, so that puts us in a situation uh, with the delaying tactics and the legal strategy fail though it might be and probably will be, but it could actually succeed in a long shot, which would put us in a constitutional crisis for real, because I suspect people would go out into the streets and there'd be all kinds of strange- I'm, I'm super afraid of that, Eric. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm super afraid of that. That's why as much as I want to say it's a long shot, we have to raise the possibility with folks that this is still possible. So be prepared to have some kind of reaction to that. But let's just say he doesn't win that backdoor attempted coup. Let's just say he will still be his intransigent self and not cooperate with a transition process that every other president before him has done. 
that puts us in a situation that we should explore at least briefly. We've got coronavirus, we've got cybersecurity problems, we've got this crazy man unilaterally drawing down folks in foreign situations that will cause us and our troops to be endangered. Alan, what are you seeing the country being at risk for most, especially when this GSA woman, whatever her name is, won't certify that Biden and Harris have won and release the funds for a transitional program to begin? Well, right now, it is if the United States does not have an effective government. It's that Donald Trump has ceased being president and spends all his time watching cable and tweeting. And the, the scariest thing is this enormous resurgence in the COVID-19 epidemic. And it's across the country. Uh, New York has kept their level low, but this is Wednesday, starting tomorrow, New York uh, City has canceled face-to-face -face schools because, and that's gonna displace 300,000 kids because the COVID virus is spiking. So here we have a, a national emergency and we have a former president still with the power of the president who refuses to act. And that is very frightening. You know, the issue that the Biden-Harris team has raised is that they've declared that there are two uh, vaccines that are close to being ready, mm -hmm. but we need a plan to distribute those vaccines mm -hmm. and we need money to distribute them. And Trump, by refusing to cooperate with the transition process has basically left America without a plan to address the virus, to address the vaccine and we are in terrible danger. And we are looking at the potential for another couple hundred thousand people to die because of this man's temper tantrum. Bob, what are you seeing with this intransigence and, and with the fact that Mitch McConnell and the rest of these Republicans seem to be playing along with this? I mean, talk to us about the enablers still enabling this man. Well, uh, that's a very good point. Uh, just before we went on air, I went to this uh, website, uh, snopes.com. It's the website you go to to check out a hoax to see if it's real. You know, you see something viral on the internet. Right. They did a list. They went to every state and they checked in on every uh, congressperson to see their latest reaction to the election, whether they've uh, congratulated Biden and Harris or if they've alleged that this was a fraud. Mm -hmm. And you just have to go by party as you get to each state. Republican after Republican still following this guy and saying, well, we need to wait till all the legal votes are counted. So they're still enabling them in great numbers. Uh, I clicked on Wisconsin and the only one who hadn't said anything was Representative Sensenbrenner, which I remember from, uh, uh, he's, been in, he's been there for uh, multiple uh, terms and he's, he said nothing. So these enablers are out there following him and, 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 and spreading Trump's gospel still, even though they know better. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's scary when the people who are, and I'm trying to, who said it? Uh, well, Barack among others, these folks need to wake up and be real. And as to your other point, uh, Alan, about, as uh, to the coronavirus, Dr. Fauci came out just the other day and said we needed a national plan. Now, uh, this state by state stuff isn't working. So, you know, we need the funding from this person in the GSA and we need to get going. So we've got. I built on what Bob said, because I think what's going on in the Republicans is they don't want to be attacked by Trump. I mean, he's purged top government officials, he's purged lifetime civil servants. They don't want to be, a he got 71 million votes, which is inexplicable. And um, I think the Republican office holders, most of them are more concerned about right wing challenges in their primaries and supported by Trump 
than they are about um, Democrats or reasoned people trying to displace them. We saw that in Alabama where uh, Trump supported a football coach who didn't even know the basics of the United States government yeah. against Jeff Sessions because Jeff Sessions, who I don't like, but Jeff Sessions had alienated Trump because he, uh, he refused to fire Mueller. And as a result, Sessions lost to the football coach. And they look at this and they say, you know, if we anger Trump, he's going to turn on us like he turned on all these other people and we'll lose our jobs. Yeah, but here's my question. Hmm. We've got a pandemic and a transitional team needs to be brought up to speed to deal with hmm. how do we roll out this vaccine or these vaccines in an equitable, very expeditious, very efficient manner. We also have, I saw the video, just this one, either El Paso or one of those Texas cities mm -hmm. where the food, the cars for food lines stretch for miles yeah. because people just cannot feed their families. And so Mitch McConnell is basically enabling Trump without a transitional team to fix the pandemic or without another plan to help the folks in this country economically, people who are starving, small businesses that are going under. And I know that the transition team would be trying to attack both those issues if they could get some traction to make the transition actually work. What does that say about where this country is when it comes to partisan politics that doesn't take the well-being of the American people into account? Right. Look, the Biden campaign was based on the idea of healing and going across the aisle, bridging differences with the Republicans. And what we have seen really since 1994 with Newt Gingrich, straight through to today, that the Republicans in office are not interested in going across the aisle and bridging differences. They've become the party of no, of anti-government. And what the Republicans, by supporting Trump's refusal to participate in the transition, are establishing that they're going to continue in that track. This bodes very badly for the United States because it's go they're going to be trying to prevent any action by the Biden administration, by Biden-Harris administration, to rectify problems of climate, to rectify problems of economic collapse, to rectify problems of illness, to rectify problems of race and racism. And they're saying, we're not going to help heal. And uh, Biden, if he keeps trying to work with them, I don't think he's going to get anywhere. And I think that uh, if the one thing Trump did succeed is in bringing enough Republican senators on his coattails to keep the Senate and to keep Mitch McConnell in power. In that respect, he succeeded uh, dangerously so, because Mitch McConnell, uh, of course, is the leader of, uh, well, he's Dr. No himself when it comes to reaching across the aisle. Well, I'm going to try to hopefully say that maybe there's a ray of hope if I sent you guys links to the folks who are trying to do for the Senate runoff in Georgia, what they did yes. to Biden, <laughs> because they turned Georgia blue for Joe Biden. And so if maybe folks get behind the same group of people, they might be able to make those two Senate runoff races in Georgia get the Senate to a situation where Biden and Harris won't be hamstrung because the last report I saw, both those runoff races in Georgia for Senate are currently a toss up. So if we can get a groundswell of people to get behind Stacey Abrams and her groundswell ground game people that turn Biden, Georgia blue for Biden, mm -hmm. they might be successful in not just one, but both those Senate runoff seats. 
And so I'm going to push as a nonpartisan editorial comment on this particular <laughs> broadcast, folks. Send your money to the Stacey Abrams folk in Georgia. I don't know if it's tax deductible or not, but I think it's fair.com or something to that effect. And let's make sure Mitch McConnell is not the chief arbiter of the Senate come January 20th. I, 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 and actually that runoff is January 5th. So we need to make sure those folks are successful in Georgia. Um, well, we probably got what, a couple of minutes, Bob? We have uh, exactly two minutes left. Okay, well, my internal clock's working. Uh, <laughs> the, the bottom line is, I my key takeaway on Donald Trump fighting hard to not concede is because he knows when he leaves office, even if he pardons himself, even if there is no special prosecutor. Ralph Nader had an interesting article on either um, uh, I want to say counterpoint. I think it was counterpoint, one of the online outlets, that they need to appoint a special prosecutor to make sure he does not get away with all the crimes that he committed while he was in office, so that another rogue president does not enter office like him and use him as a template to get away with all kinds of crimes. Nader might be right, but I don't think even if Biden does a commission and do whatever, they're going to go down this road of, oh, no, we're not like a third rate, third world country. We don't prosecute our previous. If the guy committed all kinds of crimes, you need to prosecute him. Just because you got precedent that you don't do that, crimes need to be prosecuted. But anyway, I think he does not want to leave that office because even if he pardons himself, Letitia James in New York and at least a couple of other state attorney generals are coming for him and his people. And I think they're going to be successful. And so I'm guessing that all the lawsuits that he's facing, there's a woman who's after him for sexual assault. She's after him for, I believe, libel or maligning her name. Um, the, the state attorney general in New York is after him for the, the, the no, the district attorney in New York. And <laughs> so we, have, we, have, we have 20 seconds. For all kinds of stuff. Anyway, listen, folks, that's why he doesn't want to leave office. Listen, Alan, thanks for joining us. Bob, glad we did it again. This has been Media Watch, brought to you by EVT Educational Productions, the good graces of Zoom and Manhattan Neighbor Network. I'm Eric Tate. I'm Bob Anthony. Catch up to us on Twitter and on YouTube at Media Watch EVT. And I'm Alan Singer, and thank you for having me. And we'll catch you the next time, folks. <laughs>